So we are happy to have David Nadler from UC Berkeley today, and he will speak about Verlin the formulas in Betty geometric land lens. David, please. Great. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I joke to Jan that I'm happy to be back in Kansas. I always have a good time in Kansas. I think the last time I was in Kansas, I, I came home with a t-shirt for my son saying someone, someone in Kansas loves me. Um, so I, um, right, so I would like to talk about some ongoing work with Ji Wei Yun. Some of it appears already in papers, which I'll mention along the way, and then some of it is uh, soon to appear, and then some of it is not so soon to appear, or we hope soon to appear, but more likely not so soon to appear. Um, I'm very happy to default to uh, spending much of my time on part one, which is a, just a review or an introduction to Betty Geometric Langlands uh, before I get to any new material. So please ask questions, um, interrupt, um, yeah, as we go along. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so part one is this review of Betty Geometric Langlands and um, there's a reference that uh, I wrote a nice survey with David Benz V, so which uh, I think is a good place to see what this is about. Um, and uh, I'm going to only be able to give you the kind of broad contours of things. Hopefully that will at least orient you as to what kind of game this is. Okay, so what's the setup? Okay, so the setup is that we have G, say a complex reductive group. Okay, so if that already is uh, kind of uh, abstract, you can of course think about SLN or GLN, those are certainly interesting. Uh, and always we'll have in mind fixing inside of it a Borel subgroup, so something like upper triangular matrices. And then inside of the Borel, we have its unipotent radical. Okay, so strictly uh, upper triangular matrices, matrices with ones on the diagonal. And then we also typically write H for the quotient of B mod N, which is a torus, what people usually call the universal carton. Okay, so it's of the same rank as a maximal torus of G, but it's not embedded in uh, G. It's uh, simply abstractly defined. Okay, so this is the given input. And whenever you have this input, you also have the Langlands dual version of this input. So we'll write G check for the Langlands dual group, Langlands dual. So this is also a complex reductive group. Okay, so for example, if you started with G as GLN, then G check is GLN. But if you started with G as SLN, then G check is PGLN. And anyway, there's a kind of combinatorial prescription for how to go between G and G check. And then we have all of the same uh, constructions. We put checks on it uh, for, um, for the dual group. Maybe I can say in particular that by the time you get to H check, which is B check mod N check, this is simply the dual torus. Okay, so every torus has a dual torus. And uh, so the H check for the dual group is the dual of the original H for G. Okay, so this is the input group theory. And now the input um, geometry is uh, X, a smooth projective complex curve. Okay, so smooth projective complex curve. Okay, which, um, you can think of, if you're geometrically or analytically minded, you can think of as a Riemann surface, that's perfectly fine. And it's useful from the start to have the possibility of allowing marked points. So we'll write S for some marked points of the curve. Okay, so if I were to draw a picture, I draw something like this. So here's X, and then inside of X, there are some marked points S. Okay, so that's all of the input data that we need. Okay, so we have a group and from that group, it's dual group and then a smooth projective curve X. And now what we're going to do is formulate a kind of mirror symmetry statement. Okay, so we're gonna formulate, um, maybe I'll move to a new sheet. 
we're going to formulate a mirror symmetry. Look. Mirror symmetry conjecture. Okay, so for mirror symmetry, we're going to need an A side. Okay, so let's start with that. So the A side you can think of as in some sense the question and the B side is going to be the answer. Okay, so what is the A side going to be? And I should say that in classical Langlands, the A uh, should stand for automorphic. So sometimes you may, I may say uh, automorphic. You might wonder what did I mean? And you can just know that that's a synonym for saying the A side. Okay, so we're gonna study a certain symplectic manifold. Okay, so what is the symplectic manifold going to be? Well, we're gonna start with the moduli bun G N X S. Okay, so let me tell you what this is. This is a, a mouthful, but let me try to demystify it. Okay, so this is uh, the moduli uh, stack, okay, of G bundles. If G is SLN, then those are just vector bundles. G bundles, let's say E on the curve X, okay? And then along the marked points, we're going to give ourselves reductions to N, okay? With N reductions along the marked points S, okay? So I recommend if you don't want to think about that level of generality, you, you kind of excise it uh, from the discussion and you just think that what I've said is to study the moduli of G bundles and take S to be empty. Okay, so, so it, is, <laughs> it is more than for G, GLN, it's more than just a choice of a flag. At each ah, no, okay, yeah. So for GLN, it, the, um, it's not a choice of a flag, it's a choice of a point in the, what people, I guess, call the fundamental affine space. So, for example, if, N, if we're looking at rank two vector bundles, then a B reduction at a point would be a line at that point but an N reduction would be a vector at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a kind of, unfortunately kind of technical distinction that um, I could have elided and just written a B reduction and then you would have been right that it would be a flag at the point, but I want to state things accurately and so um, better to take an N reduction. Okay, so for GLN an N reduction uh, is the generalization of going from a line to a vector. It's a kind of, nested frame, if you like. I don't know better words for it. It's a, it's a point in the associated fundamental affine space, G mod N. Yeah, but S can be empty in what you're saying. S can be empty, yeah, to take S empty. You, you'll see that I'm not, I'm not including S because I'm, uh, I love the generality of it, but later we're going to need it when we do some gluing, okay? Mm -hmm. So yeah, but for, for at least for the most basic conjecture, um, uh, you can take S empty and, and you're already still doing very, very interesting things. Hmm. Okay, so this is, this is a uh, smooth stack. Okay, and uh, so you can play with it as if it were a smooth variety. Okay, so you have to understand that objects have automorphisms, but you can play with it as if it's a smooth variety. And so in particular, you can take its cotangent bundle. So let's write T star, Bun G N X S. Okay, this is the cotangent bundle. And the cotangent bundle of bun G has a beautiful reinterpretation via Serre duality in terms of Higgs bundles. So this you can think of as the moduli. Question? Oh, apologize to interrupt. So um, are you going to mention what you mean by any reductions or not S? Ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, so let me. Um, Thanks, yeah, so let me say a word. So let me give myself, let's call it F, okay? So <clears throat> what is a, and I'll, I'll just move this here, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll erase this and put it in again if I need it. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so what is an N reduction F along S? Okay, so I take the G bundle E, okay? And I look at its restriction to the marked points, okay? So this is just a bundle on these marked points. Okay, so it's a, if you like, let's say you have one marked point. So then this is just a space with a free transitive G action. Okay, and now what I ask is that, that there be a N bundle F. Okay, so F is an N bundle. So this was a G bundle. F is an N bundle. Okay, so it's just an N bundle on a point. Okay, 
and I require that there's an isomorphism with its induction up to G. Okay, let me move this over here. Okay, so that's what I mean by an N reduction. It's the giving of an N bundle along S so that the G bundle can be obtained from the N bundle via induction. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah. so, some sort of a, a trivialization. Around. Yeah, that's right. If N were the trivial group, this would be a trivialization. Mm -hmm. right? Thank you. If um, another way to say it, maybe you just say uh, alternatively, it's a, you look at E along S and you quotient by N and you take a point in here. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe you take, let's call it uh, sigma. X. I mean, I guess that's if S has a single point. Uh, so maybe, maybe say it's a section. Alternatively, it's uh, it's a section of this associated bundle. I mean, this this G mod N bundle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, great, thanks for the questions. Okay, so what is T star bungee and XS? So of course it's just the cotangent bundle of this smooth stack, but it has an interpretation in terms of Higgs bundles. So it's the moduli of Higgs bundles. Okay, so what is a Higgs bundle? So it is an E and an F as before. Okay, so we already had the E and the F, but now you also need the covector. And what's the covector? It's a Higgs field, okay? So the Higgs field phi is a section of H zero uh, on X of whoop, the associated bundle, G dual associated to the principal bundle E, tensor omega x twisted by s. And then you also require that the residue along s of phi is inside v dual f uh, tensor omega x s. Okay, so this is all at, at s. Uh, B dual, you take Borel and you twist it by F or what? That's right. You take the Borel and you twist it by F. That's right. So, um, yeah. So if, um, I mean, this is, this is very, this has nothing to do with it being a Borel in a sense. This is just, if I were to look at G bundles with any kind of extra data at the points, then the cotangent bundle would be modified by allowing poles at those points, but prescribing that the residue of the Higgs bundle lies in the dual of the Lie algebra. Um, so um, here, here B dual is arising because it's the dual of G mod N. So, um, mm -hmm. okay, but again, I don't know, maybe, I, maybe I've already made a strategic mistake in introducing S, except that I need it later. <laughs> so, so, you know, you should just take S to be empty for now. But, uh, well, anyway, I'm trying to make my life easier later. I'll pay the price now. No, no, no. I mean, <clears throat> it's not an empty question from my side because for you, S is just a subset. That's right. Not, not a sub scheme, so it's not a collection of points with multiplicities. So. No, for the, yeah, it's just a collection of points, closed points. So you, you will not allow irregular Higgs fields. That's right. right. I will not allow. That's right. I mean, I either will, yeah, so maybe I will, won't be saying anything interesting in that direction. That's right. Mm -hmm. Everything will be regular. Um, yeah. Okay. So this one is a smooth stack, as I mentioned. And this one is a, is symplectic. It's a cotangent bundle. Okay. And so what is the A side? Well, we want to study the A brains in this symplectic manifold. Okay. So our goal is to David, understand. I, I hate to say, but since you said stack, so it's not the manifold, it's a stack. 
And so yeah, so the first one is not a manifold. It's and the second fortunately one or fortunately, mm -hmm. depending on what you, how you view life, it uh, typically will have a big open that looks like a manifold, but then a boundary that has automorphisms. So there are unstable objects as well, typically. Yes. So and then the cotangent stack is also stack for the same. It's reason. also a stack. Yeah, and there's no so it's no longer smooth. So it's no longer smooth. Yes. So so I'm gonna give you precise definitions of everything, but it, I'm saying these words more to kind of orient you as to what's going on. Like mm -hmm. I do recommend you think about this as symplectic and that you do think that we're going to be studying A brains in this symplectic manifold. So, okay, but I'm going to give you a precise definition of what I mean by A-brain that won't care that this uh, cotangent bundle is not even smooth. Uh, but just for uh, symplectically oriented people, uh, they should not uh, make any parallel to, uh, to the homological mirror symmetry where you have something like Foucault category. Oh, you should. Uh, you should. This is exactly... I, I'm... I'm I mean, the way I think about what I'm discussing with you is that I would like to understand a, a certain wrapped Fukaya category of this cotangent bundle. Yeah, but then you need not a holomorphic structure, which you have so far, but you need some real symplectic structure. Right, so, so when the real symplectic structure here is, let's forget that bun G was complex. Let's just think about it as a real, Manifold or stack, and uh, then you think it's cotangent bundle. So I'm not going to use the. No, 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 no. It's 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 not going to fly. If you have um, a complex manifold, the cotangent bundle to the mm -hmm. manifold uh, is of course complex symplectic manifold, but mm -hmm. then. Uh, you can take consider it as a real, but you cannot forget about imaginary part of your symplectic form because it will give you the B field. Uh, so no, it's not, I mean, you. Uh, sorry for interrupt, just go ahead, maybe, maybe later. Yeah, it's not. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, I, I, I claim anytime you have a complex manifold, you can just think of it as a real manifold and then you can take its cotangent bundle and um, it will be the same. I mean, you can, okay, well, you can identify it with its holomorphic cotangent bundle as a, Okay, anyway, it's not, not, this is motivation more than anything. Okay, mm -hmm. so understand A brains on P star bun G N X S, but <clears throat> we want to um, include a support condition. And so we should understand the A brains wrapping in the language of physics, wrapping the null potent cone. So I need to tell you what the null potent cone is. Okay. But uh, this is kind of the motivation of what we want to do. So we want to understand A brains on this cotangent bundle wrapping the no potent cone. So and let me they explain. will be all uh, sort of holomorphic uh, Lagrangians. That's right. They will. They will all actually turn out to be holomorphic Lagrangians because this no potent cone will be. Uh, yeah. That's that's right. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay, so um, to explain what the no potent cone is, uh, let me just recall for you that there's a Hitchin system. Okay, so I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, let's write H from this cotangent bundle to some base. So I just introduced some uh, uh, some I don't know, letter for the base. Let's call it um, uh, C sub G N X S, okay? Okay, so I'm not going to go into detail except to say that what does this do? It takes an E, F and phi okay, and sends it to the characteristic polynomial or maybe I should say spectral curve, the spectral curve. Okay, or in other words, uh, the characteristic polynomial of phi plus ordering uh, along S. Okay, so phi has some eigenvalues in each fiber and you can plot those. 
and they will give you a spectral curve over your curve. And along S, you have a little bit more structure than just the eigenvalues. You actually have an ordering on them because you have this kind of flag structure. Okay, so I'm not gonna say, I have very little to say about this, except that the definition of the null potent cone, so definition, the null potent cone um, N is by definition, the inverse image of zero. Okay, so this is an integrable system. Okay, so it has Lagrangian fibers and we're gonna take the most special fiber and uh, define that to be N. So the picture, maybe I just draw. Uh, do you think of it as what is a set, is a scheme? Yeah, uh, I will think of it as a, uh, as a set. I mean, we won't need to know more than just that it's, it's underlying set. We won't, we won't do any algebraic geometry with it. We'll just do, uh, we'll do set theoretic constructions with it. Okay, so the picture, let me just draw a kind of usual picture. Maybe let me go to a new page here. So, so the cartoon. Okay, the the neopotent cone is sitting inside of the cotangent bundle. That's right, yeah. So this is a, this is a subset of T star bun G N X S. And it's, we can say it's, uh, you know, it's closed uh, conic for the dilation action on the cotangent bundle and Lagrangian. Okay, so this is uh, due to Ginsburg who, who originally proved this. Okay, somehow, so somehow I was thinking of an analogy of the Sprinkle resolution, which is a cotangent bundle of flag variety. Yeah, I think that that, that actually when you're potent to cone of the yeah, edge. Of the, yeah, that that's certainly part of this picture. You'll find that geometry at the marked points S. So so let me let me just draw a cartoon of what uh, <clears throat> you see. So here's the map H. Okay, and so the fibers of this map are in general look, nice smooth things, but then there's a special fiber above zero that's singular, okay? So maybe let me do that in a different color. So we have, we have zero and then the special fiber here is N. Sorry, real quick, is this Lagrangian for the complex symplectic structure or also Lagrangian for the real symplectic structure you were taking a second ago? Um, I think B both if I understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so okay. as just as a subset of the cotangent bundle, all viewed as complex manifolds and so on, it's Lagrangian. But also if I forget it down to being a real subset and view it as a, the real cotangent bundle of the real base, right. then it also is, is Lagrangian. Right. Okay. okay, so <clears throat> so we want to consider brains in this cotangent bundle, A brains, Lagrangians, whole, you know, complex Lagrangians that are wrapping around this N, okay? And so this is very difficult to do with any kind of analytic technique because this whole thing, this cotangent bundle is not even smooth, but there's a good definition, a very direct definition now of what we'll take as the A model, okay? So what we'll take is on the base bun G N X S, we'll take the category of sheaves, say of complex vector spaces. Of course, everything is derived whose singular support is inside N. Okay, so these are complexes of sheaves on the base bun G N X S with singular support. Okay, so this is a notion of support for a sheaf that lies inside the uh, cotangent bundle uh, with singular support. Uh, complexes of uh, what sheaves? There are options, coherence. Yeah, just say sheaves of complex vector spaces. So no, 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 no sophisticated algebra. It's constructible, not coherent. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Constructive. We're in the world of topology here. Right. Okay. So this is a this category kind of captures uh, captures uh, topology, not algebraic geometry. 
Okay, so I'm not going to discuss why this is a good model for A brains on the cotangent bundle wrapping the nilpotent cone. I'm going to just take this as, uh, as given. Okay, so this is, you could forget everything I told you before about the cotangent bundle and just take this as the definition. And in fact, let's give it a name. Let's call it fancy A sub G of X S. Okay, so this is going to be our A model that we want to study. Okay, okay, so that's the question in a sense that Betty Geometric Langlands asks, it asks, can you analyze, can you describe this category of A brains? And the answer or the conjectural answer, very little is proved in general, the conjectural answer has to do with uh, a mirror description, mirror side. Okay, so let me just ask a question. So I'm gonna now talk about the B side, about what we conjecture, what people yeah, expect. Yeah, 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 I understand that this sort of definition motivated by uh, uh, your old result with Zerik Zaslow that the mm. category can be described in terms of constructible shifts. So you tell right. us this is a definition, but what kind of a structure is it kind of the G category for which you have, or you want to consider just um, derived category of the complex? No, we, we should take it. We should take it as a kind of enhanced object. So as a DG category. Okay. So we should we should view view as a DG category. Uh, is the text finite? Uh, well, I didn't, at the moment, I didn't put any bounds on the size of the complexes. So they can be unbounded. So they can be completely unbounded. It's, it's, it, that's really an expository choice. The, you know, the compact objects and smaller categories inside of this are very interesting and worth highlighting, but that takes a lot more time and care. So for the moment, I'm not going to put any kinds of uh, bounds on the size of the objects. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> but of course, yeah, you're pointing at one of the really interesting aspects of this, but I, I guess I just will avoid it for now. May I ask a, a quick question? David? Great, yeah. So d does all of this become kind of trivial if, if G is like say a torus or is, is there something? Ah. No, no. So yeah, that thanks, Gabe. That's a great question. So let me just say as an example, if G is say GL1, okay, so, so multiplicative group, okay. Um, and let's say, let's uh, take, uh, you know, S to be empty, just for, for uh, simplicity, okay. So then what is bun G of X? It's just pick of X, okay which you can write as pick zero of X cross the integers. So there's a degree. And then this is uh, an abelian variety uh, kind of modulo uh, GL1 uh, acting trivially. I mean, I, I just want to say that there's still GL1 symmetries, but um, okay. And then what is the nilpotent cone? The nilpotent cone is equal to the zero section. Okay. And this, uh, this automorphic category or A side, A, what did I use? Fancy A? Fancy A. So let me just uh, put this up here. So fancy A. Uh, GL1 of X is just the category of local systems. I mean, I should say derived local systems on pick X. Great, thanks. Yeah, so uh, which you can describe very explicitly. I mean, the, now you're in the, the realm of very concrete things. Okay. Also the, the torus case also explains uh, this unreduction that becomes a trivial. 
That's yeah. right. Yeah. So that's interesting too. I just decided to avoid it, but yeah, that's thank right. you. And reduction thank is you a good question. Yeah. yeah. It, at some points, but uh, okay. So you can well. Okay. And uh, there's no um, stacky structure in this case. There is this modulo GL1 is stacky, but it's stacky in a very benign way. So every point of the moduli has exactly GL1 automorphisms and they're not kind of interacting in any interesting way. It's like you've just said, take your favorite abelian variety, but now regard each point as having GL1 symmetries. So it's like taking a product with BGL1. Like a Barton stack or something. What's that? There's a technical name for this thing called the Arten stack. Yeah, where... this is an example of an Arten stack. I mean, the pig zero is an Arten stack. The, the whole thing is, is a little bit too big because it has you know, infinitely many components to have any kind of representability. So it's, a, it's an end Arten stack, the whole thing. I mean, it's an increasing union. Yeah, of, uh, what's that? Increasing union with the degrees, right? That's right. Yeah, I'm just saying that the degrees kind of limit your ability to say that it's uh, kind of representable. Uh, I see, thanks, that's very helpful. Yeah, I mean, may maybe, okay, I, I have to think about, it. maybe you can have spec of, well, anyway, you can certainly have affine schemes that have many components, but uh, okay, anyway, uh, but your, everything you said was right. Okay, so what's the B side now? Okay, so our goal is to understand this automorphic uh, category. Or B side, um, can you say a word about uh, morphisms of this category? So, so morphisms between the objects. Yeah. So the objects are complexes of sheaves, and morphisms are the you know vanilla notion of morphism between complexes of sheaves. But as with most games in homological motion symmetry, that's all of all of the juice is in being able to calculate those morphisms. So it's, it's very difficult in general to calculate morphisms between you know, two different brains, that's, that's the challenge. Uh, so I can't say in general very much about morphisms except by definition what they are, are homs between these as complexes of sheaves. If, I, if we had a correspondence on uh, Bungie N next S as such that it was Lagrangian, that would uh, give a... a um, well, that would give an uh, auto equivalence on this category. Because if you, you had to say the first part again, if you had a, a correspondence on uh, Bungie and XS, such uh -huh. that uh, it was a Lagrangian correspondence, that is, you pull back uh, a Lagrangian cycle. Ah, so, so sorry, just re remember, Bungie and XS is the base manifold. So, so the, the, the symplectic manifold we're studying is its cotangent bundle. Okay, so we're trying to understand a brains. Okay, we're trying to understand a brains on this cotangent bundle wrapping the nilpotent cone. Yeah. And I've done an act of kind of violence in that I've said that somewhere you've pushed down the nilpotent cone to bungee n. So that's yeah. right. Okay, I've said that we're not going to actually study the cotangent bundle. We're actually just going to study sheaves on the base. With this thing, okay. But then it's even, so then the question is more uh, problematic. What would be the right notion of a correspondence such that it gives a... Uh... That's right, that's right. You, 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 you have to, the only thing I can say is that in practice, what you end up doing is going back to the cotangent bundle and interpreting things there. I see. So. Okay, so great, thanks. Um, okay, so let me now say the B side. Okay, so the, the, the B side. Um, okay, so now we're going to consider an alternative moduli. Okay, we're gonna consider the moduli of local systems. Okay, just usual local systems for the dual group. But since we have these marked points, we're going to incorporate a Borel for the dual group. So what is this going to be? It's going to be G check local systems on the punctured curve now, x minus s, okay? And we're going to include now B check reductions uh, near the punctures. So what does it mean? 
So yeah, so let me say it in a, in a kind of more precise way. So you can, you can express any one of these objects in the following way. You take pi one of X minus S and you look at a homomorphism uh, into G check, okay? And you take all of that up to conjugation. Okay, so that's a low, that's the first part. That's a G check local system on X minus S. And now I need a B check reduction near each puncture. So what I do is near each puncture, so let me just draw a cartoon of what's going on. So maybe here is a marked point, which I puncture, okay? So near this puncture, I can restrict my bundle, my local system, and I'll get a local system on this small punctured disk, which has a monodromy well-defined up to conjugation. And now I ask that you actually can lift that monodromy to B check. In other words, the local system is not just a like rank N flat vector bundle near the punctures, it also has a flag near the punctures. Okay, and the, with the flag per, um, uh, preserved by the connection. Okay, so near each puncture, I can restrict and I require that I have a lift to a flag near, near the punctures. Flag preserved by the monodromy of the- That's flag. right, a flag preserved by the monodromy. Okay, so here there's no N, here, here it's really B check. So it's really like just giving a flag near the punctures. Okay, so IE, we have a um, flag uh, near punctures preserved by the monodromy. Okay. So this is, uh, what kind of object is this? This is, uh, again, uh, an algebraic stack. Okay, so this is in fact a uh, affine variety modulo uh, an affine group. Okay, so it's, it's a kind of a very nice example of a stack. A nice stack. And the affine varieties are uh, isomorphic in the right category for uh, X and X prime different. So they uh, don't seem to depend on the complex structure of it. Ah, okay, so very, very, good, very good comment. So the first remark uh, that, that has just been made, which is wonderful, is that this moduli, moduli only depends on the topology of the pair XS. Okay, so if you look, all that's in the definition is pi one. Okay, so. And G check, but. Well, G check, I mean, it depends on G check, of course, but my point is it doesn't depend on the complex structure on X or, or the specific location of S. It only depends on the, the pair X comma S uh, as their underlying topology dictates. Right. Okay. The pair of integers, literally G and N. Uh, that's right. Yeah, you can think of it even as just into, you know, I like to say it depends on X comma S because the, it, it has interesting symmetry. If you go around the moduli of mm -hmm. curves of, you know, genus G with N marked points, if you go around that moduli, this, Loc this moduli of local systems undergoes interesting uh, changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, but, absolutely. I'll wait for that. So that's basically the mapping class group. Uh, X, yeah, the mapping class group X. Right. Wait. Thank you. Okay. So, okay, now we need a B model. Okay, so the B model that we'll take uh, is the following. So let's call it fancy B G check. X, S, okay? So this will be the category now of, I would like to say coherent cheese, but since I earlier did not put any bounds on the size, I'll say indecoherent, okay? So this is indecoherent sheaves 
on this moduli, loc g check, b check, x, s. And here I don't want to explain it, but there's a notion of singular support for incoherent sheaves. And here we'll insist that they have no potent singular support for uh, in, in n check. Okay, so I'm not going to explain this, but uh, maybe I'll just say that n check is the null potent cone inside of the shifted cotangent bundle. So you look at the cotangent complex and you look at its minus first term of loc g check, b check, x, s. Okay. And there's a natural null potent cone there. And you take, we require that coherent sheaves have support. This is a notion of uh, the Rinkin Gates query. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm not What does L? So, so this is the this is the cotangent complex. Sorry, let me move. Ah, all right. So, okay, tangent, so, tangent. This. Okay. Yeah. So this is the minus one term of the cotangent complex. Okay. So I don't really want to explain this because it'll take us too far afield, and it's kind of I don't know, not relevant at the broad strokes. I I. I planned, although I'm still just in the introduction. Um, so, but in any case, um, okay, so now I'm ready for the, the main conjecture. Okay, so the main conjecture. I'm just, uh, I think I'm missing something really simple here. Mm -hmm. uh, the nilpotent cone was defined uh, in the space bun J. Well, actually in the cotangent bundle then. But that's right. So over here, uh, it's some kind of a subset in this different space, loc uh, g. That's yeah. right, that's right. It, it, in the original one, it was in the usual cotangent bundle. Here, it's in the minus one degree uh, cotangent bundle. Uh, right. I think the question was simpler. That yeah, much simpler. So I check that belongs to, to the cotangent bundle to the space, which looks completely different. From. Oh, I mean, maybe are you? Maybe I should maybe use a different symbol. Is that? I mean, this n check has nothing to do with the prior n. Is that? Is that the? Ah, okay. I think so. Yes. Okay. So maybe let me use another uh, kind of another symbol here. Maybe I'll use. Um, uh, I have to use some letter n, but maybe I can use some different font or something. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what's a. Um, I'll just try to make it look different, <laughs> okay? Okay, yeah, so it's a completely different object. Maybe I'll put a check on it just because I wanted to convey that it has to do with the dual group, but uh, okay. So what's the main conjecture in this subject is of course the mirror symmetry that you should have an equivalence between these two. Yeah, but it's a, a funny thing is that on the A side, you use mm -hmm. constructible sheaves, but, uh, 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 and on the B side, you use sort of a coherent sheaves, but uh, here you take coherent sheaves on something topological. And ah, so, so no, but it's, you see the, the, the moduli, this, uh, this moduli is a, nice stack. I mean, it's a complex stack. It's an affine variety, modulo and affine group. But the point is that stack only depends on the topology of X and S, but it is an algebraic stack. Yeah, since you promised to degenerate something at your plan, so I assume that you, your X will not stay. That's right. My X is soon to degenerate. In the next minute, my X is going to degenerate. <laughs> but, but the point is that um, I mean, these are coherent sheaves on an algebraic stack, but just the point is the algebraic stack only depends on X comma S as topological uh, input. Okay, so this is the main conjecture and um, let me spend a, uh, well, let me make a remark. So, based on a prior remark, which was that the moduli only depends on the topology of X comma S, this conjecture, it implies another conjecture, which is that AGX 
only depends on the topology of XS. Okay, so that's also a conjecture we don't know how to prove, um, but is is. Uh, so in your main main conjecture, it, it it must there must be some souped up versions where um, there is action on. So for example, on the right hand side, I I'm not sure, but I can predict that there will be an action of the mapping class group. Yes, that's right. So you can you can equip both sides with a tremendous amount of additional structure, and ask. And the main conjecture should pres preserve all of those that additional structure. Okay, good. But I don't. Okay, I guess the the conject the next conjecture is saying that there should be an action of the mapping class group on uh, left hand side as well, such that the two actions are compatible. Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's what this second conjecture is saying. It's saying it only depends on the topology, so there should be a mapping class group action. That's right. Uh, is it obvious? What does it mean for g equal gl one? So for g, uh, for g equals gl one, we saw that the a side was the moduli of local systems on the Picard. And you can check that that only depends on the genus of the curve. Uh, what about the B side? Of course, I'm confused in this complicated notion. I mean, it's a zero section, but you should consider perverse coherence shifts with the no, no, no perverse. So the B side in that case is just local systems on the curve. And then you should consider coherence shifts on that moduli of local systems. Ah, just coherent shifts. Yes, yeah. L minus one doesn't. Yeah, the L minus one. Ah, it, it plays a role, but it's very, very. Oh, sorry. It, it changes the coherent sheaves to being perfect complexes in that case. So, so for GL one, uh, yeah. So maybe I I should have said this. So maybe uh, let me just kind of let me do in the spirit of Gabe's earlier question example. Okay, so G equals GL1 and S is empty. Okay, so then uh, loc uh, GL1 of X, okay, is just equal to, well, X has a, has a genus, so it's GL1 to the, um, uh, to the 2G modulo GL1. And then it has plus some derived structure. Okay. And this uh, B, fancy B, G check, uh, this category B check, GL1, fancy B, GLX equals perfect complexes on loc GL1. Okay, so what the singular support, yeah, this is just a response to Jan's comment, what the singular support does in, um, in this situation is changes you from studying all coherent complexes to studying perfect complexes. Okay, so, okay, so I'm of course short on time. So there's many, many things that I, I guess I, I wanted to say, but I guess I want to just move now to degenerating curves rather than say those additional things. Okay. So this is now, we'll now go to part two. Okay. So degenerating curves. Okay. So the idea is that we'd like to understand these categories, A, G, X, S, and B, G, check X, S by degenerating X to a simpler curve, okay? So what we want to consider is a, let's have a smooth base, okay, with some distinguished point, say zero, okay? And in the, uh, the general fiber, we should consider families of curves. So consider uh, nodal degeneration. Okay, so we have a generic fiber, which I'll draw like a topologist, looks like this, say. And then we degenerate it to a special fiber, 
which is now nodal. Okay, so there's some vanishing cycles that get contracted to nodes. Okay, so we have our generic curve X and then we have our special fiber X plus, X minus, and then it has some nodes Q. Okay, and <clears throat> now we can ask, can we relate the story on X to the story at the boundary here of the moduli of curves? Oh, I should have said, we also can have marked points. So we can have some marked points. Okay, so we have some S minus and some S plus coming from some S. Okay, so we want to recover these categories, A, G, X, S, and B, G, check, X, S from the degenerate versions. Okay, so this is what I mean by a Verlinda formula. So Verlinda formulas in, uh, you know, in Simon's theory and so on tell you how to, or conformal blocks, tell you the dimension of conformal blocks in the WZW model um, in terms of smaller curves, in terms of the structure constants for P1 with three points. So we ultimately want to degenerate to marked genus zero curves and recover what's going on in general from those marked genus zero curves. Okay, so let me state a in, result. In, uh, in conformal field theory, this process is, uh, or this, this thing that the vector space is, uh, it's called factorization or the factorization rules of uh, Verlinda. That, yeah. Uh, that these conformal blocks are uh, factorized nicely as you degenerate the curve into mm -hmm. uh, Verlinda blocks or uh, Verlinda spaces for curves of lower genus, but with- right. Yeah, so that's all we're trying to do with just a categorical version of that. Uh, will you have some kind of factorization category as an I mean, we, I mean, ultimately, there's a three point category which has lots of, uh, you know, genus zero three points, which has lots of interesting structure. So I don't, I won't say anything about that today, in part because I don't know as much about that as I would like. But um, okay, so, so I'm going to try to let me just formulate a result, a conjecture, and then we can discuss. Uh, <laughs> Okay, well, a couple of results on a conjecture and then maybe I'll pause, and I'll stop and um, okay. So, um, so let me mention a, uh, like I said a result. So we have a kind of spectral gluing or B side gluing. Okay, so B side satisfies gluing. So let me explain this or at least just state it. Okay, so this you can find in a paper 16020737 with David Benzvi. Okay, and what is the result? It says that if you take this B side for uh, the generic curve, <clears throat> you can recover it by looking at um, the two pieces. So let's look at X plus, S plus, and then we add the nodes Q, okay, so Q is the name of the node. So there's S plus and Q inside of X plus, okay. And we also have similarly for X minus. And it turns out that the general category is isomorphic to the tensor of these over the affine Hecke category acting at Q. So I'm not gonna be able to explain this right now, um, but you should think of this as a formula saying that the general category is given as a tensor of the categories along the boundary uh, glued up over a natural Hecke algebra acting. Okay, so this is the uh, affine Hecke category. At the level of K groups, it means what? Uh, at the level of K groups, I'm not sure I know a better thing to say than just the K groups of the formula I wrote. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess at the, probably it's saying, ultimately it's probably saying something about the, you can get to the cohomology 
of the moduli of local systems via the cohomology of the moduli of local systems of the two pieces. Um, and what's happened with the fine Hickey category? Yeah, but I don't know. I haven't thought, I haven't never thought through your questions. I, I don't know. I'm just trying, trying to add some color to it. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> okay, so a main conjecture then just a is that A side. Level question. Sorry, uh, let me just finish the A side also satisfies gluing. Okay, question, yes. Uh, I'm just trying, I mean, it's a really down to earth question. I just try, so if I take an object uh, in the category on the left hand side, mm -hmm. saying that I can write it as a tensor product of the category for half of the curve and uh, the. That's right. That's right. Some object in the category for the other half of the curve. That's so right. That they're glued together somehow nicely. That's right. That's right. So, okay. So this. Uh, Never mind. Let, let's talk it out because I don't know anything about the Hecke affine thing. So yeah, I find Hecke. Okay, yeah. So I can't. I, I just. I think at the moment I don't have time to. To. Uh, well, you, you shouldn't be concerned about you know like it's not chess if you miss, like exactly. Uh, I see. Okay. So so let me just say I'm going to I'm going to speak for another five minutes and then pause. Okay. So that that's that's what I'll do. And then if you want to ask questions or just have an informal discussion, I'm happy with that too. But I want to be able to release people who you know I don't. I, anyway. Um, okay. So let me state a, a, a theorem. So let me state informally a theorem uh, with Ji uh, Wei Yun. Okay which is, <clears throat> I'm only going to be able to state it informally, okay, but um, let me state that, uh, so we construct, okay, we can't prove the construct, the conjecture yet, but we construct a functor, a g x plus s plus q, a g x minus S minus Q tensored over affine Hecke category to A G X S. Okay. And <clears throat> moreover, this struct, this functor is compatible with some of the symmetries that people have, well, that we've mentioned a little bit, compatible with the kind of, uh, well, maybe I'll mention them, Hecke symmetries. Uh, parabolic induction and um, what people call Whitaker normalization. Okay, so these are key controlling structures that guide your expectations about uh, uh, mirror symmetry in this situation. And let me say a word about uh, about how this, this uh, functor is constructed because it's, it's, it's constructed in a way that's very general to the world of A-brains. And maybe, I don't know, I think you probably, I think you had Vivek Shenda give a talk in the seminar at some point. And they talked about some joint work that this, this kind of construction is related to. Um, okay, so the idea, idea of the construction, okay. So we have a, uh, a base, let me say a special point zero, and we think of having a family above that base, okay, of symplectic manifolds, okay? So it's a family of symplectic manifolds, and we're gonna do something that's not a kind of usual thing to do. We're going to take a, Lagrangian brain, okay, so this is a Lagrangian brain, okay, and we're going to follow it as we move in this family and take its limit, okay, so take its limit brain. Okay. So if you really work with Lagrangian brains, it's very difficult to make sense of this limit, okay? But if you work with sheaves, 
this can be formalized. Okay, so this is formalized. I'm confused. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you work with manifolds, uh, so what's what's the problem? the problem is in general the limit will not be smooth. The limit will be very singular. So you start with some smooth family of Lagrangians and you degenerate them, you'll get something quite singular. Yeah, but that it's not a problem. You can include singular brains. Ah, so if you're happy con con including singular things, then probably that your version will be similar or the same as what I'm going to say. Okay. We we formalize. Let me just say this is, can be formalized by uh, nearby cycles, so kind of traditional notion uh, of sheaves. So if you reinterpret the Lagrangian brains in terms of sheaves and then take their nearby cycles, um, you get, uh, uh, you, you, you get a functor that you can interpret as having to do with Lagrangian brains. So, okay, so I think I won't, uh, say more, but well, maybe I'll say one last sentence as a kind of a key input. Yeah, so but add to, yeah, what, kind of. what is the functor then? Ah, so the functor then is we look at, um, so we go back to our family of curves. Okay, so let's, let's give this a name. Let's call this uh, pi going from some x and we have some smooth base, uh, I don't know y. Okay, so we have family of curves over smooth base y. Okay, so let me let me go back down here so I have some more room. Okay, so we apply this this to the following. So we look at bun. Say, let me dress drop the marked points. Bun g pi over this y. So let me call this capital pi. So this is the moduli of relative bundles, bundles on the family of curves, pi from x to y. So we have a family of curves, then we pass to relative bundles and we take sheaves on those relative bundles and we take nearby cycles of sheaves. Okay, so what this does is it constructs a way to transport brains from the generic category to the category at the boundary of the moduli. Okay. So, uh, Betty version of a specialization of a D module. Exactly, exactly. Betty version of a specialization of a D module. Mm -hmm. And the functor in this theorem is adjoint, adjoint to this limit of brains. Okay, so the limit of brains goes in the other direction. It takes a brain, an A brain in the generic category and specializes it to the boundary. And the functor is a, that we construct as an adjoint. And that, that seems to be the most natural object in the game is this adjoint. So let me, um, let me just mention that a, um, a key ingredient, if you want to learn more about this key ingredient, you can find in the paper 20.03.11.477. For a long time, we didn't know what to do, but this, this paper gives some uh, commuting relations for nearby cycles over higher dimensional bases. This is the key technical input needed to, to prove the theorem. Okay, so I think I'll pause here. Let me say what I didn't say. Let me just say, kind of say one sentence. What I, what I didn't talk about is, is if, if I had time, time three, I would have talked about applications. And here I have in mind two low genus examples. So, um, okay, including, including this affine Hecke category. Okay, but I think I'll stop 
uh, the kind of official discussion here. I'm happy to, of course, answer questions or just chat more. Um, but uh, I hope I also gave some some references along the way where you can find, uh, yeah, you find some interesting things to look at. Okay, so thanks very much for listening. So thank you, David. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, now questions. Could, could you quickly give me an idea of why you need nearby cycles over higher dimensional bases? Do you just need one dimensional just to define the, the functor, but higher yeah. dimensional check relations about it? That's right. So here I formulated in, in this main theorem, I formulated that this, the adjoint to this nearby cycles uh, comes from the tensor over the affine Hecke category. So mm -hmm. in order to prove a theorem like that, let me just draw one diagram to answer Arnav's question. So, so, um, so, you know, when you calculate like M tensor A N, how do you do this? Well, uh, you know, if you're working with derived things, you calculate this as the co-limit of the kind of bar resolution. Oh, good, gotcha. Which, you know, has this kind of a shape. Great, so you keep putting in more and more little bubbles of heckiness there. That's right. So what you need to do is you need to understand what happens as you bubble more and more heckiness, as you say. <laughs> That's right. So, so in fact, the paper that I hope will appear soon has some title like Hecke bubbling. So the point is that we, we bubble lots of uh, small curves and control how that, you know, diagrammatically, how, how nearby cycles behave as we bubble. Very cool. And, and yeah. could you say just in words is fine, at a high level is fine, what, what do you mean by the applications in particular? I don't remember now, but I think you have Verlinda in your title or abstract or something. Oh, well, okay, so Verl for Verlinda, I just mean that one would like to, um, you know, ultimately describe these automorphic categories in terms of low genus, uh, you know, P1 with three marked points, say. But the, the example that has motivated me to pursue this for a long time is that I would like to take an elliptic curve what we plan to do, I mean, it's in progress, take an elliptic curve and degenerate it to, to say, a nodal P1. Mm -hmm. And in that way, you'll relate the category. I mean, th this will give you the means to prove that the category for the elliptic curve mm -hmm. is the Hochschild homology category mm -hmm. of the category for P1 with two marked points. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the category of P1 with two marked points is the affine Hecke category. And so that will tell you that the elliptic curve is the co-center of the affine Hecke category, which is kind of a kind of open calculation to make. And should I think of that as like some categorification of Verlinda or something or just the... No, I mean, I, I guess, sorry, maybe the Verlinda is misleading. I think of Verlinda as just being the idea that you're going to take a, like oh, a field theory like this and express, like have a formula for like the dimension of the, here, here the dimension of the conformal blocks is the automorphic category. Right. And the formula for it is like, you know, these kind of gluing, this kind of gluing conjecture and so on that, that you can express it in terms of smaller pieces. Yeah, I don't see but... any signs. So. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So it's maybe, maybe, okay. I don't know. Gotcha. Maybe it's, okay. yeah. Yeah, so sometimes you can speak about categorification and then when you go, when you decategorify, you reproduce sort of the formulas which people knew before. And Verlinda, I mean, at least yeah, so this is not, this is not, I mean, I don't know anything. Uh, well, okay, so you could decategorify here by like passing to cohomology of the moduli. So here we're, here we're kind of two steps up from Verlinda. Verlinda is like numbers. Here we're categories. So, <laughs> um, okay, so maybe it's misleading. I don't know. I use the word Verlinda, maybe mis um, it's, maybe it's, it's not helpful. Vector spaces and numbers, so that's yeah. usually how it goes. Right. I mean, Verlinda, you can think of as being more, you, you don't need to say just the dimensions. You can say like, you know, this conformal block, no, these, these, these conformal that. blocks are given as tensors of these conformal blocks. I mean, there are formulas like that. So may I, there are, you, so we should attribute two things to Verlinda. One, the computation of the actual vector space, that's the Verlinda formula. And the second thing is uh, Verlinda's uh, fusion rules, which are again formulas, but those fusion rules or factorization rules are precisely these uh, kind of formulas that uh, the dimension of uh, the conformal block for genus G is determined by the dimension of the conformal block for lower genus curves with punctures. Sorry, am I forgetting? I thought that was Ferdinand Schenker. 
No, Verlinda is before that. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, Friedman and Schenker did the uh, the geometric part of that. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, like I said, don't don't take, don't take my use of the word for Linda to be very well informed. I don't. You know, you cannot. You, you really have to find the relationship. <laughs> I mean, I mean, what I what I think is a nice what I think is the key here is like in you know in geometric Langlands. It's um, there's you know it, this is a kind of relatively well I don't know it's a kind of a new attempt to try to understand things in geometric Langlands by going to the boundary of the moduli of curves. That's kind mm -hmm. of not something standard in geometric Langlands. So uh, kind of yeah, but actually there, uh, there was sort of a recent paper by Danagi uh, with collaborators, two of them physicists. Mm -hmm. And uh, they studied, it's not the Betty side, it's rather Dalboy, it's Higgs. Mm -hmm. And they, they degenerated curve there. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So um, I should look. Higgs. But uh, actually, it's kind of maybe a general question about this Betty JLC. Mm. Uh, uh, what kind of representation theory? Uh, is related to that. I mean, because on, on the other side, on, 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 on the Higgs, on the Delbo side, you have plenty of geometric representation theory, like a uh, Yeah, I think of, I think of, um, well, okay, so let me give you, let me sort of, I, I think of this as encompassing a, a huge amount of standard, you know, complexly algebra, complexly group, even, even potentially piatic group representation theory. So I, I recently wrote a paper, you can find online, I don't know the, the archive number, with uh, David Benzvi, Harrison Chen, and David Helm, in which we used ideas from this Betty story to, um, to describe all representations of GL, GLNQP, you know, piatic group, Mm -hmm. as coherent sheaves on a certain genus one moduli. Mm -hmm. So um, so I mentioned it just to say that, that I think this Betty story contains a huge amount of representation theory. Um, yes. You know, kind of there is this Dalbo and there is Betty. There is this JLC, which goes back to 90s. Yeah. Yes. Like, and there is some geometric representation theory related to that huge amount and with this relatively recent uh, Betty GLC. So my, I would like just kind of a, to <coughs> two kind of representation uh, theories, which so, appear and there. Yeah, and so, so what I can say, I guess, maybe one thing to say is that uh, in, in some sense, okay, I don't know how, I, in some sense, the relationship of usual geometric Langlands to Betty geometric Langlands in terms of representation theory is something like, Betty geometric Langlands is about like the highest weight part of kind of what you might see in usual geometric Langlands. So usual geometric Langlands, you study, for example, all D modules. And so in like local geometric Langlands, you'll see like all loop group representations. Like there's no kind of control. In the Betty theory, what you will primarily see are what you would call highest weight, things, things that have to do with Hecke algebras instead of entire groups. So in some sense, it should just be like easier. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not maybe that you see a different kind of representation theory. It's rather that you see the kind of more combinatorial part of the usual representation theory. And, and also in the usual GLC, people speak about quantization, you know, like. Yeah, there's a version here as well. I, I haven't, I know David Benzvi and David Jordan and some of their collaborators have written papers about there's the same story. I mean, you should, you know, the Betty version is, you know, how to say it, it's not, it, it only differs from the usual version in some sense in the, the measure of integration. So like if you, you know, these moduli have, have the same points, like the moduli of local systems in either the sense of Pi one representations or Durham local systems, they have the same closed points. 
So it's not that they're so different, it's, but, but one of them is affine and the other's not. I mean, they're sort of, so they only differ in their kind of global algebraic geometry. They don't differ point by point. So, um, so I don't think you should think that what we're talking about here is kind of radically different. It's just a kind of topological version um, where, you know, like, um, you know, at the very basic level, if we said, let's study D modules on, you know, GL1. Okay, so if you're, if you're in the Durham theory, okay, you would discover that that's the same thing as quasi-coherent sheaves on A1 mod Z. Okay, so that's a kind of usual kind of Fourier transform description that you get like difference modules on A1. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say instead of saying D modules, you said local systems on GL1. That's what you would say in the Betty version. So then you would get quasi coherent sheaves on GL1 or GM. So the difference in the Betty and the Durham version is the difference between GM and A1 mod Z. So they're not so different. I mean, they're of course radically different from the perspective of algebra, but they're not so different. I mean, from the perspective of like irreducibles, I mean, they have the same closed points, A1 mod Z and GM or the same closed points. So I guess I'm just trying to emphasize that it's not, this Betty version is not like a completely different thing. It's just a kind of, it's in some sense, it's like a change in the structure, you know, in the complex structure rather than uh, something more radical. I, I have two questions, which I think you might, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so when I was thinking at some point about non-compact mirror symmetry, I realized that physicists, like actual physicists, wouldn't ever care about algebraic uh, sheaves in any sense. They would be perfectly happy with complex analytic sheaves. And usually mm -hmm. for like a compact lab, you have threefold or whatever, we have Gaga, so nobody notices the difference. But for actual non-compact guys, it seems much more natural to talk about complex analytic sheaves. And my question to you is, do you think it's possible that there exists some complex analytic story in which both of the stories that you just said lie? Probably, yeah. I mean, I've heard people talk about this and like maybe that there, there's, um, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, wrapped categories, you can talk about uh, speed of wrapping and you can end up rather than with polynomials, but with power series and other things. Right. Uh, I don't know more than I'm just saying, but it, yeah. No, no, but also there is this relatively recent activity about analytic uh, geometric Langlands. Oh, the Edengar. Uh, yeah, probably that's what you mean, yeah. But I think that's something different. I think that was something categorical in which both the Betty and the Durham statements li live as subcategories. Right. Uh, it's just a bigger equivalence of an A model and a B model or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's I think Garnov's probably right that physicists, without there being some additional discussion, probably would never see anything algebraic at first pass. Like that's an. Uh, yeah, I so. think they still do not know that. Uh, the RAM and, and Betty has different algebraic structures. I see. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I think from far enough away, you can't tell the difference between these two, uh, these two stories. But um, yeah, some of them do. <laughs> like, we, we don't have to <laughs> integrate them. Um, no, okay. um, and sorry, I, I have another a bit more self motivated question. But, uh, you know, Fried Hopkins Telemann, as a result, that often felt very close to various geometric language statements because, for example, like you say, you got loop group representations out very naturally. But when I ask my friends here, they they all care about Durham geometry language because you know that's the prevailing story, and they say no, I can't really figure out how to fit the very finite category that you talk about. That you think about these highest weight guys inside there. Based on what you just said, is there an, a possibility of seeing Fried Hopkins Telemann more directly from your Betty geometric language story? Yeah, my, my I mean I don't know. We'd have to, to discuss it more, but yeah, I mean my guess is, I mean I, I you know have a kind of faith based approach yeah. that uh, you know. <laughs> If you start talking about field theories and gauge theories and groups, and you know, it has to follow from like some reduction. Yeah. I mean, the Betty. I, I will say the Betty story. I think is more in line with like Capust and Witten and things that are like ha are known to have like dimensional reductions that will give you churn Simons and so, you know. So it's like, um, yeah. I just can imagine. I can't. It's hard to. Uh, I mean, maybe you don't need Betty, maybe it's just geometric, but I mean, you can certainly get churn Simons out of geometric Langlands. And so, um, okay, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I think they're all, they're, there shouldn't, it's kind of grand unified uh, gauge theory, I don't know. <laughs> okay, great. I mean, that, that, I still don't have a proof of Reed Hopkins settlement I really like. Constantine says that he has one now, but I, 
I don't know. I haven't kept up with the archives. I haven't seen it. But I'll kind of doubt all he's put it up there yet. Uh-huh. And so you, you say that the, the, for Kapustin Witten, you have some kind of beta side uh, story like what, what is a canonical coisotropic brain and phenomenon? no I mean okay so that's an object that doesn't exist in the Betty world that's that's the big difference between the Betty world and the kind of traditional world the traditional world has coisotropics in it the Betty world does not but, but this is something about your choice of singular support condition right and you could probably change that if you wanted to I mean, yeah, you could you could decide to have no singular. You could decide to have singular support possibly everywhere, and then you would get some even bigger thing. Um, but I guess I, I mean, Kapustin Witten kind of kind of have it both ways in some sense, and that they say things like, "We want to study Lagrangian brains." So, so if you insist on being Lagrangian, you're you're squarely in the Betty world. So one way to think about it is the difference between the Betty world and the traditional world is whether or not you allow coisotropics. And so, but at the same time, you can say, okay, I want to study only Lagrangians, but I'm going to do it by pairing them with the, you know, space filling brain. And so, you know. Yeah, that's one way, yeah. Like your Lagrangians, they correspond to the modules and you just introduce abstractly this canonical coisotropic brain, which represent the differential operators. Whatever. Exactly, yeah. 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 So that, that yeah. So that that's a technique I think of to to study, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. It's maybe there is. And I have another question. I mean, this traditional GLC it's sort of for, um, restricted to this demodule story, yeah. um, which quantization of of the total space. I mean, uh, the basic notion is a spectral curve, then you consider kind of a moduli uh, space of line bundles on the spectral curve. So uh, like you put the Picard over each spectral curve. So you have, again, very roughly mm, in total space of the kitchen system, and then you quantize. But uh, your uh, spectral curves, they live in the cotangent bundle to X to your, uh, so you start with a two-dimensional geometry. You have a curve, you have a cotangent bundle, and you have a notion of a spectral curve, which is basically complex Lagrangian in in this symplectic manifold in the cotangent bundle. So it's very simple. Okay, now let's take a, a different symplectic surface like C star square, mm. which physicists are also interested in. And you can look for spectral curves in it. Mm. So it's not a theory of D modules, it's a theory of QD modules. Right, right, different one, yeah. And uh, there is still a Riemann Hilbert, which mm-hmm. means that you can speak about the RAM and the Betty. There is a substitute for the character variety which you use. Uh-huh. I see. All right, so then I'm just curious uh, whether uh, one can go further and define the categories like. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, um, I, you know, I can just refer you, I know David Jordan, is someone who's thought, uh, thought a lot about this. So maybe he or his collaborators would be able to mm-hmm. entertain you in some way. Um, I mean, he, he's, yeah. Uh, he's definitely thinking about what you would call quantum, you know, Betty Langlands, um, which, uh, you know, is, is, is exactly this deformation from D modules to difference modules and so on. So, uh, yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't know very much about it. Uh, okay, more questions? Uh, yeah, I was uh, trying to work out an example of this uh, degenerating, uh, uh, Lagrangian in a family, mm. um, but I want to confirm. For, so, is it that the um, that the ambient manifold is kept fixed and the Lagrangians are moving in that manifold and degenerating? That's right. Yeah. So uh, the way I, I have in mind, although one could, I mean, the ambient manifolds uh, say you could even always think of it as like 
cotangent bundle to a fixed base manifold. Yeah, that's what, okay, and, good. So this is very, I mean, such a degenerating family is very easy. Well, is, uh, one can describe it geometrically in uh, the uh, uh, Higgs moduli space as follows. Take a generic point in the Hitchin base. Mm -hmm. So the fiber over that is, uh, as was mentioned, uh, an abelian variety, which is not mm -hmm. true. It's actually a torsor over an abelian variety, but uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, uh, but by a generic point, we basically mean that the zeros of the differential are all simple. Okay. So now in the Hitchin base, start to move such that two of the zeros collide. So yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. So what would happen to the abelian variety is that it will, uh, there will be a vanishing cycle. So mm -hmm. it will generate into an uh, abelian variety of smaller rank cross C star. Right. Um, and but then you can collide more and more points together. And there's a mm -hmm. certain locus where the, uh, which is called the endoscopic locus. Mm -hmm. But the point is these degenerating uh, um, Lagrangians are easy to describe, although the maximally degenerate, I don't know how to think about that, which is the global nilpotent cone. But in your example, you could have any degenerate Lagrangian, right? Or were you hitting? Yeah, so, so um, um, th yeah, that's right. I mean, there, there's far, it's kind of more abstract, but that's right. You can, you can have, um, uh, yeah, I mean, highly, I don't know, highly degenerate. I mean, the point, the reason I'm, I'm hedging is because technically I don't work with these as Lagrangians. I work with them as sheaves. And so it's a completely different kind of language to discuss them. And then there's a dictionary that allows you to go back and forth between sheaves and, and Lagrangians. But it's difficult to, for me anyway to unwind how that dictionary goes, you know, how, how it works in this example. No, but in terms of uh, degeneration of graphs, do you have just trivalent tri tri graphs or you can have many points collide to, to a single one? Is it oh, like yeah, it can be quite degenerate. I mean, there can be, yeah, I mean, there's no, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, let, let me say the, f the key phenomenon, which is maybe, you know, kind of, might be surprising is you take a like a family of Lagrangians and in the limit if you're not careful it need not be um, isotropic even anymore mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it may not be Lagrangian you can have a kind of a blow up like you can take a limit and have a blow up so the 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 key thing to be to take care with is you really want to Basically, I have no further requirements other than I want you to make sure you take Lagrangian limits, <laughs> you know, like, like you don't take limits that are like coisotropic. I think they have to be checked. So the limit that I've described, if that is uh, the inverse of some point in the Hitchin base. Yeah, then it's, then it's. Uh, the map is flat, so you're good. But yeah, I mean, that's right. And in fact, that's in some sense, the reason that we know in this story that we don't have these kind of non-Lagrangian limits is because everything we study is guided by taking fibers of the Hitchin map. So mm -hmm. we kind of know that since the Hitchin map behaves well in families, as long as we're only studying fibers of it to generating around, then we, we won't go wrong. Mm -hmm. so. And, uh, okay, I mean, there's still uh, more to discuss about this because for example, but I'll just say it quickly. Because, uh, for example, instead of uh, just looking at uh, the curve degenerating, one can look at the curve with the differential degenerating on it. And in low-dimensional topology, uh, degener curve with a quadratic differential have been uh, studied a lot. So that only works right. for until two. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's is that that's like. Uh... Yeah, okay, I don't know that I, I mean, you can, yeah, again, I have to translate into language of sheaves, but. Um... I, that's, uh, so to get over this problem, uh, <laughs> there is a, I, so the second question was, which was brought up, I think we were pretty close to completely understanding uh, and maybe saying something about the conjecture in the C star case. So where uh, G is C star and you wrote down the uh, uh -huh. variety explicitly. Yeah. Uh, I, just so if we if our curve is an elliptic curve, then uh, 
Loxis and without any points, then I guess Loxis is uh, just uh, C star cross C star because you're conjug I mean, you're conjugating by an abelian group as well, and everything is abelian, so that just goes That's away. Right. That's right. So the moduli space is nothing but just uh, C star cross C star. Yeah. Which no, is kind no. of this, so, so in some sense, nothing's happening. It's the same, you know, <laughs> it's the no, same before right. and after. Yeah. One thing I can explicitly give you how the mapping class group acts on uh, this space explicitly. So mapping class group being SL2Z. Uh -huh. And how it acts as a, it's a very interesting uh, dynamical map. Uh, well, I can tell you right now. So mapping class group is SL2Z. Each mat write down the matrix as A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. map, which sends Z1, Z2. So Z1, Z2 are the two coordinates on C star cross C star. Mm -hmm. And they go, then the first coordinate goes to Z1 to the A times Z1 to the C. And the second coordinate goes to Z1 to the B times second uh, coordinate Z2 to the D. So okay. that's the dynamics of uh, uh, this group. And that's uh, well under, uh, I mean, that's uh, very well understood by uh, Goldman and uh, that's interesting, but I think one can understand this uh, other object that you want to uh, study on it. So this, um, what was it? So for the conjecture, you needed some category on C star cross C star. Um, if you go up to the conjecture. Yeah, sorry, let me. That's the thing that I would like to understand in this simple example. <laughs> the main conjecture? Yeah, uh, so, uh, wait, maybe before this, was there some, I mean, there was a conjecture where log, yeah, uh, here, 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 go, uh, so uh, down. Yeah, exactly. What is BG check access in the case G check is C star? So we've described, so we've- Oh, I described, oh yeah, right here you mean, yeah. Yeah. So this as we've, uh, Genus is one, so you just get C star cross C star. Yeah. And then B, G, L, one, X is, what is this thing, perf? Perfect complexes on, uh, on C star cross C star. Can, is this understandable? Three modules of a run polynomials. Yeah. One more time, please. It's complexes of three modules of a run polynomials in two variables. In two variables, okay. Two variables being the variables of C star cross C star. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, okay, that is, explicit enough. <laughs> That's good. I think if I, okay, so I can actually, I will try. So now I've described the action of the mapping class group on this moduli space. Mm -hmm. I believe one can write down the action of the mapping class group on uh, the space that Professor Soibelman just described. That's right, on the, on the category. Yeah, I mean, in this case, I think, yeah, I think it's... Uh... It's very close to what David said about the difference between C star and A1 mod Z, because it's 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 very close. I mean, very close, very related example you have. Okay. All right. At least in terms of SL to Z action, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, so more questions. Uh, uh, David, uh, may I ask you to uh, to send me the slide? I mean, the notes of your. Of course, talk. yeah, uh, of course. I may not do it for in the next hour because I will meet with a student. But then. Uh, <laughs> yeah, whatever. I mean, it's okay. not urgent. It's yeah. okay. Uh, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. And thank you again for listening. And um, yeah, yeah so. it, it's good to see and hear. You know, as, well. Anyway, it's nice to be back in Kansas. <laughs> Any time. Uh, all right. So uh, thank you organizing and thank you for speaking. Okay. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah. it was very. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Nice to see you all. Thanks. Thank Bye. you, David. Thanks. Thanks, Shagun. Okay. So then, this is it.